I mean, if your, your passion and your intent is true, um, you know, follow that passion. And then on top of that, I think one of the biggest challenges, and this is even a challenge for myself, let people help. Because there are people out there that want to help. And so be willing to receive that. Allow people to contribute in the ways they can and want to. Hey everybody and welcome to Impetus Minds of the Driven. On this episode, we have an incredible guest, one that has been working with the EPA for several years now here in Atlanta, Georgia. He has also built one heck of a dance community with the conjunction of some other people, but has been super influential in my dance journey with West Coast Swing, is uh, one of the key reasons why Atlanta Swing Dance Classic is one of the greatest swing dance events to go to in the country, much less on the East Coast, and is the owner, operator, founder of Wicked Westy, which is one of the uh, main dances that's held weekly here in Buckhead, in uh, one of the more ritzy areas of Atlanta. Um, and we're gonna get into all of that about how he built these things, where he found the drive, how he got into dancing. Um, and if you want to get a little bit of what West Coast Swing is, maybe have a small lesson and see Alan and I dance, you have to go over to 4runnerproductions.locals.com. Over there, you will be able to be a supporter. That's how we keep the lights on. That's how we're able to bring you awesome guests and to be able to travel and have all of the great equipment that allows us to bring you superb audio and superb video all the time. So again, make sure you go over to 4runnerproductions.locals.com. Also, this episode is brought to you by Pale Horse Coffee. If you want amazing coffee, to get you through the day or specifically when you feel like death, make sure you go to palehorsecoffee.com and use promo code FORRUNNER at checkout to get 10% off your order. Alan, it's been like, what, two years, three years since the last ASC, since I got to see you, it was 2019. 2019, it's been a while. It's been a, it's well, a thank while. you for all the kind words uh, leading up to this though, <laughs> really, thank you. It's really awesome to have somebody that it really has been, we were talking about it just before the camera started rolling, like to have someone that's been so influential in my dance journey to be able to come on and, and share your experiences and share uh, what's driven you to be so influential in people's lives like this. If you've touched my life like this, there's no telling how many others and uh, to be able to get the behind the scenes look at it. I'm, I am extremely privileged to have you sitting here, man. So thank you for making time for us. Well, it's my pleasure and uh, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Now tell me, how long have you been living here in Atlanta? I've been living uh, in Atlanta since uh, February of 2005. Since so, two, yeah, 16 years. And you moved here for work? I moved here for work from Jacksonville, Florida. Okay. And that was for the EPA. Right, so I moved here for the Environmental Protection Agency, that's correct. Awesome, so what do you, what, what do, you do for the EPA? Uh, currently, uh, I'm a first line supervisor. I lead a team of people that uh, works in the FIFRA realm. So FIFRA deals with um, pesticides. Mm -hmm. So uh, pretty much anything that uh, people use to clean bacteria or viruses or um, even goes into stuff related to crops and uh, stuff like that. Uh, we, uh, we have a role to make sure that it actually does what it, say it says it does mm -hmm. and make sure that uh, it's being presented to the public um, in a way that makes sense and that they hopefully use it correctly. Gotcha. So with you guys dealing with something that deals in viruses, you've probably been really busy over even in the lockdown period because of COVID and everything like that. There's been a lot of energy into the program, that's correct. And you just came out of a training program. What is the, the training that you've been going into? Uh, well, the training that we're going through this week is more focused on leadership. So uh, disc style uh, leadership, uh, 360, okay. learning about myself. So it's been really interesting uh, the first, uh, first two days and uh, I'm excited for the rest of the week. What, have you discovered what your leadership style is? Um, I, uh, I, based on what we did today, yes, uh, we uh, went through it. And it's really interesting for me because um, when I first took the test back in 2011, I was in a very different role um, as an inspector. Um, I, I ranked as an ID, um, and now um, I am uh, uh, more, pardon me, I, I ranked as a uh, CD, and mm -hmm. now I uh, rank as a um, S. SC. So my leadership style has uh, switched a little bit to uh, really, uh, I think, uh, kind of because of my position change. Mm -hmm. So can you, we, I'm huge on leadership. So th this is something that we didn't talk about in the notes. This is off the cuff. 
and I'm super intrigued now because I, I grew up uh, reading John Maxwell, listening to Simon Sinek, Dave Ramsey, all of these guys that, that talk about uh, leadership stuff, Ray Lewis, and all the things that he talked about in leadership, especially whenever he was playing for the Ravens. Uh, so break down for me a little bit what SC style leadership is in the in the it, we say it was the disc disc style disc yeah. style yeah. So um, really, uh, it deals with uh, being pretty consistent, pretty calm, um, being able to uh, you know really really be steady, mm-hmm. uh, really um, be uh, coming energy for the team and so that's one of the things that i feel is is important uh, especially now there's a lot of energy into the program and uh, with that energy there's a lot of asks there's a lot of people inquiring about certain items Mm -hmm. and with that um, there's a lot of action in terms of demands and um, quick action being requested and so from that from that sense Um, I see myself as almost a go-between or a moderator for my team. I need to let my team do their work. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I need to be responsive to the people that are asking for information. And so from that perspective, I try and be a calm, steady hand. Mm -hmm. And I'll let my team do their work because they're the smart people. They're the people that, you know, really lead the team. I just happen to be the person that has to coach and lead the team even further. So uh, really need to let them do their work and keep them out of the firefight. So now I'm going to role play for you. So I'm going to put you in the hot seat. I'm on your team. I come to you and I say, holy crap, Alan, we have this problem. Okay. Input problem that you see in your brain, audience input problem that you see in your brain. doesn't matter really what it is. We have a problem. I'm freaking out. I don't know how to solve the problem immediately. What is your immediate response? And I'm sure that it's based on the problem, but like it generic problem, what's your response to me? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, f- from from that from that particular perspective, I'm going to ask some good questions. I mm-hmm. hope uh, ask you to describe the situation. We'll identify a uh, particular task or particular action that can happen if there's resources that need to be found or um, pulling in other people. Um, you know, we'll identify those resources, get them to. Uh, to help solve that problem and and seek a uh, an amiable and uh, hopefully worthwhile uh, result out of it and uh, take action. All of that comes to my mind because I, I uh, remember Simon Sinek telling the story of a guy that he used to work for, and Simon Sinek uh, comes to his boss and he says, "Holy crap, I jacked up! I don't know what to do." And he was like, and his boss was just like, "Okay, yeah, you messed up. What are you gonna do?" And he's like, I don't know, I, uh, I think we should do this. And his boss is like, okay, do that. <laughs> and then they didn't even give him anything. It was just like, you know, I, I trust you, solve your problems, right. make you feel safe in your job. And I, I think that that's really cool because this, the steady hand is the person that I always feel like it gives the people that work in, that org- in, in any organization. It makes them feel secure in their job. And if you don't have people that feel secure in their jobs, uh, that's when toxicity comes in. That's whenever people start getting uh, start feeling threatened, and whenever people start getting feeling threatened, they start getting defense defensive about things. And so, every organization, I think it's it's kind of cool to to know what your leadership style is. I totally see it too. You've always been a really even keel guy, no matter what's going on. Yeah. Um, so that's that's a really interesting thing. How did you uh, what what did you get your degree in? And, and sort of walk me through how you uh, you know went from graduating in Jacksonville, working in Jacksonville, to moving to Atlanta. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And uh, <laughs> um, you know, as we evolve and, and grow up and learn a little bit more about ourselves, our perspectives change, and we learn uh, learn more about our interests. So graduating from Jacksonville University, which is a small private liberal arts college um, in Jacksonville, Florida, so in the northeast corner of Florida, um, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in marine science. My senior year, I did an internship with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. For lack of a better description, it's like the state EPA. Mm -hmm. Uh, When I was working there, I was really uh, enamored with the energy and the passion that every single person I had the opportunity to work with put into their work and their their belief in the environment. 
and finding ways to you know nurture the environment so it's there for future generations mm -hmm. but find ways that it it is um you know still functional in terms of it's, us as people yeah sustaining a population absolutely interesting and so so you graduate, you work, you get to work for them. Uh, at what point do you get the job offer? Do you apply for the job? In yeah, a... great, thank you. And uh, so uh, I had been looking, um, after about six years working for the agency, I started in 98 and um, 2003, 2004, I was kind of exploring options. And I had the opportunity to work with um, uh, a number of environmental protection agency um, staff people, the way the federal government and the state government interacts is the federal government actually um, gives grant money. They give money to the states. The states then implement the rules. And, and so from that, uh, from those interactions, there's oversight, just, you know, making sure this people are fiscally responsible with the money that the federal government is, is giving to the state program. And so taxpayer dollars, man, ta taxpayer dollars. Absolutely. And, and so, um, as, uh, uh, as the EPA was doing their due diligence, I had the opportunity to work with a number of people from the EPA uh, collaboratively and, um, you know, just really saw the work that they were doing and was really interested and intrigued by the broad, um, broad impact of the federal government and just seeing how not only were they doing work that served the people of Florida, but for me, the piece that I was really interested in was the work that they were doing for the entire nation and beyond the nation, just globally. And uh, I really liked the people uh, and uh, it seemed like a really good opportunity for me uh, in my career to kind of broaden my horizons. And um, they had a position I interviewed. Um, I think the interview went well mm -hmm. and they, uh, they asked me to be a part of the team. So uh, I said yes and uh, moved up to uh, Atlanta in February. Um, I didn't know a single person in Atlanta <laughs> outside of um, Stacy uh, McBreen, now Zellner. And I knew her through dance, but uh, beyond that, I was I was a completely blind move. I, I was moving to the big city and and, and didn't know uh, didn't know didn't know a soul. <laughs> didn't know a soul. So we're gonna backtrack a little bit. You told me that you were in college from ninety four to ninety eight, and you That's moved correct. up here in two thousand and five. Yes. So you started dancing in nineteen ninety nine. Yeah, I did. It's, How did you discover dance in general? How did you get into the West Coast swing community? Yeah, the uh, I found dance kind of right at the end of the neo swing era. So back in like the late '90s with uh, the Cherry Pop and Daddies and the Big Big, big Bad Voodoo Daddies and uh, Zoot Suit Riot and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that whole era was kind of just blowing up um, East Coast swing, and there was a local um, a local hangout that. Um, myself and friends frequented and um, still living where um, I graduated from college, still a lot of college friends. And this was a particular venue that welcomed all ages. Um, mm -hmm. So it welcomed, you know, 18 and up. Uh, so it was, uh, they didn't serve alcohol. It's kind of like a juice bar, muffins, all that other fun stuff, but they had, they had dancing in the back room. And uh, it's just, it was so much fun. It was people having a good time, uh, you know, just dancing, uh, rocking out, you know, uh, just there's just so much joy in that community and uh so that really um uh, really kind of was like my first taste of of dance and from there it kind of uh, blossomed with some of my really close friends um we were all dating some girls and the, the interest in dance was there and eventually it, was, it just turned into uh more than just uh just like something that i wanted to do but um in terms of like just having fun it turned into something i was really more interested in um learning a little bit more of the education or the how-to so I could improve my dancing and, you know, hey, um, get a little bit better and, um, and show off a little bit more, right? So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's how I uh, found dance. And then from there, it just started into uh, taking some lessons. What was your first event that you went to? The, uh, the first event that I ever went to um, really stems from my dance background. So as much as I found East Coast Swing first, um, there was a local bar uh, called Crazy Horse. It was a country western bar. Um, and uh, who would have ever thought the kid growing up in a suburb of Chicago would go to a country bar <laughs> and actually enjoy it. But mm -hmm. I went to a country bar. And uh, so I actually started learning all styles of country western dance, which include country western two-step, um, waltz, East Coast Swing, West Coast Swing. And uh, they, had a, they had a weekend workshop down in Orlando, so about two hours away from Jacksonville, Florida. 
And um, I can remember on a Saturday morning getting up at like 6 a.m. in the morning because the first workshop was at 8 o'clock and I drove like two hours and took lessons from like 8 in the morning until 5 at night and then danced and then drove home. I forgot everything I learned, but I just had so much fun. <laughs> I had so much fun just going and, and being in this, in this bigger arena of so many people just wanting to learn how to dance. One of the things that I've noticed is that it's the general desire to learn how to dance will get you to the door. Going to a couple local dances is, is great, but people really get the bug when they go to their first like event. Absolutely. And they see how big the community really is because the small communities are cool. It's, you know, it could be anywhere from you know, six people to a hundred people in a local community, depending on where you're at. You go to one of these events, you're talking 300, 600, like ASC. Yeah, mad jam, a couple thousand. thousand. Yeah, yeah, like a thousand and a half to almost two thousand people there, and you're just like, "Whoa, you got people from Japan here! Yeah. You got like, it's nuts." Uh, what my uh, uh, partner was from Japan. The that jumps out at me is because Fumiko Naka was my partner at Mad Jam, right? Literally the weekend before COVID shut down the world. <laughs> Uh, so that, that, that's why that, that jumped out at me. Um, and now they're having dance events all over the world. I mean, you got stuff like in Tel Aviv, you got stuff in Germany. Absolutely. Um, so at what point, that was your first event. At what point did you get the competition bug? I think, uh, the first event that I got the competition bug at was, uh, an event called floor play in Orlando. Where was it? It was in Orlando, Florida back then. And that was, uh, in 2001. It's moved to Tampa now, hasn't it? Um, I believe it's kind of jumped from hotel to, to hotel, but don't quote me on that. Okay. Um, but I, I believe it's still um, in Orlando. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's where I got the first... Uh, that's that's where, where the New Year's events. Yeah, it's a New Year's event. So it was probably, um, I don't know, four or five months after Orange Blossom, the first okay. uh, country western event that I went to. And uh, yeah, they had a Jack and Jill there and um, everybody did it. I mean, you just pay some money, go out and dance and, and see how you do. And uh, so uh, I did it and uh, I had a blast. It, it helped though that it came in third place. So it always helps Ooh. to do well in your first contest. So, okay. The audience isn't going to be familiar or the majority of the audience isn't going to be familiar with what Jack and Jill is. Oh, so yeah. break down, uh, especially from an event organizer's perspective, I could describe it all day long, but I want to hear how you would describe uh, competition, specifically Jack and Jill competitions? Well, one of the great things about a Jack and Jill contest is that it's really social based. And so uh, from that perspective, what it does is it allows everybody to participate um, without having to worry about a partner, without having to worry about putting a routine or choreo choreography or, or spending time um, leading up to the event. And so it still allows the competitive nature of certain people to show without having to put a lot of preparation in terms of a routine with a single person. And so from that perspective, a Jack and Jill is uh, people, um, leaders and followers choose to um, enter. Um, within the West Coast Swing world, there is uh, the World Swing Dance Council. It's a, we'll say governing body. They kind of lay out the rules for, for Jack and Jill contests. And so they have levels. And the idea there is to kind of have people with the same amount of experience dancing together to allow them to showcase their skills together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it's a purely random a luck of the draw. Uh, so as you said, you could end up with somebody from halfway around the world, or you might end up with a person that you actually know from back home. So mm -hmm. it's, it's purely luck of the draw. And I think that's some of the excitement too, is, is just who are you going to get? And it's, 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 a lottery and it's like, yes, that's the person I want to dance it's with. Getting judged on get, getting to compete with your social dancing. Absolutely. It's just, it's random partner, random music. Good luck. <laughs> it's really a joy. The first time my grandmother, my, so my grandmother's my, my favorite dance partner. First <laughs> time she described that to me, I was like, you gotta be nuts. Cause I was all, I was used to ballroom dancing. That's all. That's the only thing I had ever known. Um, and the thing that, that struck me about it whenever I finally did my first Jack and Jill was how starkly different it is than the ballroom world. Everyone thinks that like swing dancing falls into the ballroom thing because you know they do East Coast swing or jive or whatever in, in the ballroom world. And this is 
is what my aunt described as street swing. <laughs> and in the ballroom world, it's cutthroat. Mm -hmm. Like, unless you're at a private event with people that you've known for a long time, like everyone's super serious. Right. Everyone's going out there. They're trying to, to really go hard, compete. Um, there's not a whole lot of congratulatories or handshaking and stuff like that. Like it, it's like going almost to like a, a major sports game with di the different teams or just like the different couples that are out there. You go to a swing event like this and it's like everybody's cheering each other on, man. It's just a giant party. Absolutely. And I think for me, one of the things that really appeals to me about West Coast Swing and, and even the Jack and Jills is just the social, the social aspect of the West Coast Swing community. It, it really in my opinion, is driven um, by the social aspect of it. It's, I think the majority of the people that come out to, to dance West Coast Swing probably are there the first time because it's something fun. I, mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of people come into the West Coast Swing community thinking that they're gonna end up on Dancing with the Stars or being the next whatever champion of something. A mm -hmm. lot of people are looking for a social outlet um, that's uh, fun, friendly, um, accessible mm -hmm. and so from that aspect I think that's one of the things um, that's appealing to people and for me personally is um, you know one of the things that I love most about that community. Coming up here in a second I'm going to ask you about when you decided to get involved or, or how you got involved in the leadership element of West Coast Swing and how you built Wicked Westy your, yeah. your business um, and for the audience if you like this type of stuff, if you like the business building type of things, you are going to love our new show, Let's Talk Fortitude, where my dad, Big John G, interviews entrepreneurs with a specific fascination with veteran entrepreneurs on how they've built their businesses, the struggles and the successes that they have seen over the course of their time. We've just had a great interview with uh, a gentleman who helped build BRS and uh, construction was a pipe laying construction company. Uh, he's written poetry, psalmic style, style poetry, and understanding the struggles that he has gone through with family and illness and having to watch someone close to him have to learn to rewalk again. It's absolutely fascinating. So if you want that, you have to go to YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts and you have to search Let's Talk Fortitude. It is an absolutely wonderful show and we hope to see you there. Okay, so you've been in the community for a while. Now, when did you first take on, I guess that's a better starting question for this segment of it. Uh, when was it that you first forayed into uh, leadership roles in the dance community? My first, uh, for, for Atlanta, my first foray was really 2007, 2008. So kind of back, backtracking a little bit. When I, moved to, um, when I moved to Atlanta in 2005, I really didn't know anybody, but I knew a little bit about dancing. I've been dancing for five, six years now, been traveling some and, and, and met um, some people here and there. And, and so um, dance is a universal language. West Coast Swing here in the United States is the same as West Coast Swing in Japan or anywhere in the world. It's West Coast Swing, it's a style of dance. And so when I moved to Atlanta, I didn't know anybody, but I was like, man, the dance community, they're gonna be all my new best friends. And, and so I really sought, uh, sought out the West Coast Swing community because that's really over the, six years that I had been dancing where my heart had really led me and, and where I really enjoyed that community the most and, and that's how I dance. So I, I sought out the West Coast Swing community. And uh, when I first moved to Atlanta, I didn't necessarily feel all that welcome into the West Coast Swing community. I was um, a little bit younger than the majority of the people that were out dancing. Mm -hmm. And um, and so um, as much as I still enjoyed West Coast Swing, I was still looking for friends. And so I found the Lindy Hop community and within the Lindy Hop community, which was a little bit younger at the time, um, uh, I just felt really welcome there. And so um, I started doing Lindy Hop as well as West Coast Swing. And um, in the Lindy Hop community, they've run some dance events and uh, just really, really enjoyed like the organizational aspect of, of running dance events. And so from that aspect, it really just kind of like triggered just something within within me to kind of think about more about West Coast Swing. And so um, in 2006 and seven, I started um, teaching at a local studio, um, which really um, I'm thankful to uh, Sherman Murdoch, who was mm -hmm. the, the studio owner at the time for giving me the opportunity. And um, under, you know, his, his brand, um, I was a person on a, you know, a web page, but he was bringing business. And uh, from that perspective, I started to meet some people 
And uh, that kind of really kind of set the ball rolling. And so from there, I started to gain a little bit of exposure and the Atlanta Swing Dancers Club, um, one of their leadership, actually the president at that time, I believe uh, Seth Pratt, uh, came and took a lesson and uh, was um, impressed with kind of just the energy that I was putting into the lesson and invited me to come teach for the Atlanta Swing Dancers Club. And um, that was really the kind of like the, the foot in the door for me. And so um, as they invited me back, um, I started teaching there a little bit more frequently. Mm -hmm. And um, through that, I started to develop the relationships within the, within the club. And, um, you know, as those bonds grow, I, I think the, the piece of wanting to give back to the community um, was really, uh, really important to me because I, over the number of years that I had already been dancing by then, I just felt so blessed with all the friendships that I had been, uh, that I had made and I wanted to give back. And from there, I uh, started contributing more to the Atlanta Swing Dancers Club. Uh, through becoming their dance director and eventually the president of the club for a couple of years. Gotcha. So what was the catalyst to starting Wicked Westie? So the Atlanta Swing Dancers Club was also the catalyst for <laughs> starting Wicked Westie. Um, as the president of the of the club, the, the club had been in existence for a number of years. And, mm -hmm. and so me being a younger person, being the president of the club, I wanted to make some, I wouldn't consider drastic changes, but mm -hmm. changes that would... Uh, have a broader appeal. The, the club was still a little bit older, especially, you know, comparing myself to the majority of the attendees. I mean, I really wanted to make the club a friendly place that would welcome everybody. Mm -hmm. And so um, within the leadership role as president, there's still a board of directors. And so we're still a team and we have to work together as a team. And so certain things just didn't happen as fast as I wanted them to happen. And so um, one day myself um, and another person, Barbara Vicker, um, you know, we, uh, uh, we were on, both on the board of directors together, just kind of got together. And um, I said, hey, I know where the Lindy Hoppers are dancing. They have a Thursday night open. You know, let's consider, you know, starting Wicked Westy. And uh, so uh, Wicked Westy really was uh, kind of like an offshoot of of just the passion and the belief that I had that the dance needed to be welcoming to, to all ages and specifically younger people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was really the focus of West, West, Wicked Westy was uh, building a community that was uh, friendly and welcoming to everybody, but really with a focus of getting newer, younger people into the dance. So I cracked a little joke, and it was probably a lost joke on anybody that doesn't know where Wicked Westy is about it being in Buckhead, because anyone that knows Atlanta knows that Buckhead is kind of ritzy. It's where a lot of the of the rappers that have made it um, find their abodes. But Wicked Westy is in this. Uh, clubhouse that is tucked back in the woods, back away from civilization in the middle of Buckhead. And you wouldn't even know it's there unless you're getting invited to this thing. Even finding it with your GPS when you get invited to Wicked Westy is kind of fun, all except for the fact that you just see cars lined up in this neighborhood and they just mostly young kids, right? Like 20 year old to 30 year old kids all just walking down the street, going to this clubhouse tucked back in the woods. Um, so how did you come about the space? Did, were, have you guys always been in that clubhouse? Um, or did you start somewhere else and then have an opportunity to move there? Yeah, Wicked Westy uh, started in that space. And as you said, I mean, it's a really unique venue. It's, it's almost like a log cabin in the middle <laughs> of Atlanta with a $1.5 million house right on the other side of the tree line. Yeah. And uh, so it's, it's just this really fun, you know, thousand square foot venue with a kitchen. It just has a really great vibe, a nice porch. Um, and uh, the venue, um, there had been some other dancing going on there. And uh, just looking at their calendar, they, they had some Thursdays open. And uh, again, the vibe of that, the space was really neat. Uh, from a business perspective, it was affordable. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to worry about a restaurant wanting a certain you know, bar, you know, number of drinks sold or, or food sold. I didn't have to wor worry about a studio and um, just kind of the perspective of them wanting a certain percentage or expectations. It was a set fee. I rented it out. I knew what my costs were. I knew what I needed to do to break even and hey, let's go. That's cool. It's a really uh, unique space in the fact that it is only a, square, a thousand square feet. 
Yeah. And it is packed out almost yeah. At least before COVID, and I don't know how, how it's been like ever since you guys sort of, if you guys have, I haven't, don't even know if you guys have been able to open back up since COVID has sort of uh, uh, began to, to wane. I, I say that sparingly because of the Delta variant and things. This, we'll know far more about that uh, in by the time that this episode drops. So we're, we're speaking far into the future. We are the first week of August right now. There's no telling where we're going to be at in September. <laughs> um but uh, every night, man, that I've ever been there, it's been packed out wall to wall, and it's incredible. And the and the cool thing is, is that a lot of the older crowd, because I've been to the Legion um, when the, uh, with the dancing that was, was going on there, and I went to uh, Nemo's whenever we were still at Nemo's for the uh, Atlanta Swing Dancers Club. Uh, and the older crowd like to have their space; like they don't like having too right. much space. Um, a lot of the younger crowd are like used to nightclubs and stuff like that. So coming to Wicked Wessie and having that compact type of feel, nobody cares. <laughs> Just no, nobody cares if we're on top of each other, if we're bumping yeah. into each other. Gives us a reason to talk to each other. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. By the way, what's your name? <laughs> it is. It's definitely a cozy atmosphere. And that hasn't always been the case. Uh, when Wicked Wessie started back in 2009, a good night for us was 12 or 15 people. Um, a spectacular night might have been 20 for the first year to two years. Uh, uh, and since then, the, uh, the attendance has grown um, with probably, I want to say we've, you know, had about 100 people in there, you know, once or twice on maybe a special anniversary type party. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is cozy. And I, I, think, I think that creates a really, um, a really interesting atmosphere in terms of not being lost in a big space. And, and with that, it does, you know, allow people to be social because you're in uh, a smaller space, um, the focus is on the dance, mm -hmm. but there's times where, you know, the dance floor might look a little crowded. So you just take a moment to, to catch your breath, say hello to the person standing next to you and, and you know, start some of those uh, friendships. What, what have you done specifically? What has the journey of growing Wicked Westy looked like? What, what things have you specifically gone to or have you just really lucked out in the fact that it's grown by word of mouth alone? Um, t t walk, me, walk me through that. Has, has it been like or, or what are some of the specific steps that, that you've taken to, to grow that organization? Yeah, the early, on, early on there was some advertising um, that was done through... Um, Google advertising or AdWords back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, there was some advertising on Facebook when Facebook back then was a little bit younger and probably a little bit more affordable than it is now. Uh, the other thing though is really truly uh, word of mouth and, um, and the combination of those things really kind of drove a lot of the energy. For me personally, I think the, the piece that would probably really cause the most growth most growth though was really word of mouth, just bringing your friends out and mm -hmm. Uh, from that perspective, the idea of creating a friendly space, um, you know, allowing people to have a good time and, and not worry so much about, you know, being absolutely right on the dance floor the first night out, just having a good time. People are coming there to have, have fun. And so, so long as you can present that and that fun is okay, um, I think it's really going to cause people to want to come back. And from that perspective, um, that's really how I approached it. And so if you're having a good time, you're probably likely gonna you know tell a friend that hey i'm having a good time why don't you come out they got a beginner lesson at 7 45 mm -hmm. you know what next week it's actually free for the first time too so come on out no cost you're gonna have a blast trust just me just keep on coming just, just right. keep on coming the other thing that i know that uh, from experiencing uh wicked westy is the caliber of volunteers that you've had um and, and I'll, i'm gonna spotlight one of them which left uh very very soon after I left, maybe it was right after I came back to visit or something like that, but it was Olivia. Um, I, I forget her last name. Uh, yeah, Olivia Burnside. And now, uh, Burnside, now that's Olivia left. White, yes. Okay. So uh, she is married now, right? She is married. She is yes. married. So it's Olivia White now, you said? Olivia Burnside White, yes. And Olivia Burnside White. Now, uh, how did you come across uh, meeting Olivia? Because I know that Olivia taught some classes there. Yeah. Um, what what was that friendship that journey like because she is amazing also one of the most intelligent human beings i've ever met in my life uh what did what did she get her doctorate in 
Uh, she's she's a doctor of something. And she's she a is, real doctor. It's not she, like she she is a doctor, and I I I don't want to do her any injustice. So um, okay, I won't I won't specifically say what kind of doctor she is. But she's um, a doctor, and she's a real doctor. She she's not a, a fake doctor. She's a she <laughs> she got her doctorate degree from Georgia Tech, and Georgia Tech is a pretty tough uh, tough school um, as it is. Uh, but getting back to how I met Olivia, mm -hmm. I've. This is one of those ones where I kind of just lucked out. Uh, when she moved to uh, when she moved to Atlanta, she had already been doing a little bit of dancing, I believe, in Pittsburgh or maybe Philadelphia. I forget one of those two cities. Okay. Um, so she had already been dancing a little bit, and um, her boyfriend at the time, and, and now husband Roger, um, had also been. I, I think the story goes that he had been tagging along a little bit, so mm -hmm. kind of doing a little bit, um, doing some dancing, but more as. A, because Olivia was really interested in it. So Olivia found Wicked Westie and really just kind of uh, dove, dove head first uh, into, um, into Wicked Westie. She started taking classes and uh, as, as time, time passed, as, as a lot of dancers do, is they really find their own, their own voice, I think, within the dance. And um, one of the things that I'm very cognizant of is I'm, I'm limited as to what I can give individual dancers. And so one of the things that I really want to do is uh, allow people to to grow and have fun and give them enough energy um, to allow them to find their own path and Olivia then just like I said took off she started taking uh, private lessons growing her own dance traveling um, you know finding ways to improve herself mm -hmm. and uh, so from that uh, you know as um, as she uh, started to improve she wanted to, to help Another thing that I really think is important is giving people um, the opportunity to help. And uh, one of the things that um, she was interested in, I think is important, is having a diverse group of people teaching. And so from that perspective, uh, me being um, a man and dancing um, both leader and follower roles, but more traditionally a leader, I felt it was good to have more voices from both the leader and the follower perspective. So I was really happy to um, Olivia found Wicked Westy mm -hmm. and that she just wanted to put all this energy into it. So I'm very grateful for Olivia and uh, I know the Atlanta community uh, definitely misses, misses her and Roger now that they're out in the Phoenix, Arizona. Out in Phoenix, Arizona. So you mentioned before that you were the president of uh, the Atlanta Swing Dancers Club, uh, ASDC. This is the acronym for that. And we're just going to go with ASDC from here on out if it comes back up. Um, and it was one of the things that inspired you to, to start Wicked Westy. What was it like, um, being in a leadership role with one and then also founding another? Like what, what was the dynamic of being a part of sort of two different organizations, separate organizations doing kind of the same thing in the same city? Yeah, that, uh, that caused a little, it was a challenging conversation within the board of directors. I mean, there is a set of bylaws and there's certain things uh, within, um, the Atlanta Swing Dancers Club, ASDC's bylaws that, um, you know, we had to walk a fine line. And so I wanted to continue to be supportive to the club um, because I felt that the club was an important piece of the Atlanta history in terms of West Coast Swing. Um, and I felt there's other things that I could also contribute to the community that um, I needed a separate avenue to, to take. So ultimately, uh, the way that... Um, I intended to present it, and um, you know we, uh, you know we intend things. People may not necessarily always understand intention, mm -hmm. uh, but was the idea is more people dancing, is more people dancing, yeah. and so long as we can continue to build and grow, it was never my intent to take away from the Atlanta Swing Dancers Club. It was always the intent to build a community yeah. and expand that community because I would I would love to have you know, 50 people on Thursday and all 50 of those people come out and dance with us on, you know, the weekend. Mm -hmm. And so long as I didn't conflict, which I was very cognizant of, is to not conflict with what the Atlanta Swing Dancers Club was doing or anybody else that might have been doing anything related to West Coast Swing in the community at that time, I felt like I was in a good space. And so long as I could give energy to both equally, which I, I personally felt I was doing, um, I, I felt there was a win-win all around. What were some of the struggles that you faced in balancing that that win-win situation that you that you strove for? You mentioned before that there was some uh, maybe some miscommunication or misunderstanding as to as to intent. Uh, what other things that, did you face 
um, maybe with time split or just building Wicked Westy in general? Like how, how did that go forth? And then what was one of your, I'll get to the second part. What, what were some of the struggles? Let's start with the struggles first. I think the, the biggest struggle really was the perception of the idea that I may, um, for, for the record, the Atlanta Swing Dancers Club is a federally recognized nonprofit club. They are a 501c7 recognized nonprofit. Um, whereas Wicked Westy is, is me. It's a privately owned business. LLC. Or right, it's an LLC. Okay. And so I pay taxes on it. Mm -hmm. I record expenses, income, all that other fun stuff. And I think one of the greatest concerns was that because of my role as the president in a nonprofit club and the president and none of the board actually gets paid, mm -hmm. they're, they're all strictly volunteer. There was the concern, and it's a true, and I acknowledge that concern, that if I were to start something else, possibly the, the 50 people that might be coming out to the dance on Sunday would now also, or alternately, come to the dance on Thursday night, and thereby seeing the clubs, potentially seeing them lose income, and me potentially gain income because of that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was like the biggest, the, the biggest piece of where there was a challenge in the conversation of, of why, why Wicked Westy was starting. Jamming the gears, more or less. Right. Uh, what was the thing that really gave you confidence? Anytime you're doing any type of startup uh, of any type, there are times where it's like, ooh, man, like, am I, <laughs> am I really, is this really okay? And then you sort of have a, have a breakthrough moment and you're like, no, okay, like, like I got this, I can do this. What, what was that for you? Yeah, I, I think the biggest, the biggest challenge is um, when I first signed that contract, I signed a six month contract to rent out this venue. Mm -hmm. I had to go buy all, this, all the speakers and all this other things to make it work. And I mean, there's some capital, I mean, for me back then, this was thousands of dollars that I just <laughs> didn't have that I was committing to upfront to I hope it's going to work mm -hmm. and, uh, and you know, it did, but from, from that, from that first, from that first moment, I think that was the biggest challenge was just the idea of buying thousands of dollars worth of equipment, signing this multi-month contract to fill this space and just being at risk, just purely at risk from a financial aspect. I think kind of the aha moment though was, um, I think probably there's probably like three that were really important for me. Um, the first dance we ever had for Wicked Westy, we probably had about 45 or 50 people. Now I'm gonna tell you the second dance we had probably had about 15, but, <laughs> but it was really nice just to see the community come out and support it. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, probably the, the second aha moment was just the first anniversary. You know, we probably had 50 or 60 people there. And by then, you know, we'd picked up some steam, you know, 25 people were probably coming out on a regular basis. And then I think the, as silly as it may seem, um, back then I owned a Honda Civic, a four-door Honda Civic. I'm lugging around two massive, like four speakers, like two kind of wedging them in the I back. I love this. I have to like open up the back door and kind of sh shimmy the things into the back seat. And, and then, <laughs> but this is my daily driver, yeah, right? Man. So I have to load the vehicle up every Wednesday night. I get home Thursday night at 1130 and taking it all out and lugging it into the house and it just became a drain. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to buy an old van. And uh, so uh, uh, Jack Ray, a uh, guy in the community, uh, found this uh, Chevy Astro, an old school Chevy Astro van. And uh, I bought it for a couple thousand dollars. And um, so now that's where all the speaker equipment lives. So I mean, <laughs> from, as silly I as loaded it may seem, equipment in and out of this van. As silly as it may seem, man, that was a big moment. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there are two more people that I want to get into, into talking about your relationship with. And then I'm going to ask you about a third that I don't know who it might be. Um, but before I do that, it seems like one of the things that we're talking about a lot here is sort of that leap of faith moment whenever you're signing this contract and stuff like that. And uh, for the audience, leap of faiths are not uncommon in our lives. They are definitely not uncommon here at Forerunner Productions. A lot of what we have done up until now has been a leap of faith. That's why we talk about locals so much and getting your support over there. But even more than that, we actually have a 
a specific show that is based on faith. Once again, hosted by Big John G, my father. Uh, it is an evangelical show to specifically talk about our Christian faiths and what it is that it takes to be a follower of Christ and uh, what the good news, what the gospels mean to us and sharing a lot of my dad's experience of having gone through a, a spiritual desert for 19 years of his life. Um, and I witnessed that desert. I grew up through that, uh, through him uh, in that period where he was going through that desert and hearing him tell that story and share his experiences and the things that he's learned since then and even before then whenever he was pastoring a church is really, really special. I think that it's really, really important and the guests that he has on that show tackle everything from battling addiction to uh, faith walks and uh, real evangelism things where like giant revivals that he's been a part of with thousands of people where they could they had to uh, people had to park on the highway on highway 85 in greenville south carolina to go and do these types of things all of these are stories that you will get over on the shelter hole where we ask the question when the storm gets wild when life gets crazy and everything is being thrown at you and you need a rest where do you seek shelter? Hope that you guys will go over to YouTube or wherever you find your podcasts and make sure you check out the shelter hall. We hope to see you there. So the next person I want to talk with you about and to know a little bit more about your relationship with is the guy that introduced me to you, Chris Wrigley. So Chris uh, is an all-star level dancer. That's like one level below champion. So the people that do this for a living and then you got the people that are like right below them. Some of them are just that that freaking good at dancing and they have no intention of going pro. And then you have, and you're also an all-star level dancer. So it is, it is that top tier dancer that isn't like making their living champions, making their living doing this thing. And then you have the all-stars. And sometimes all-stars will get invited to, to come up to, to champion level, uh, which I find that to be a ton of fun. Absolutely. Uh, and, and really interesting to do. But Chris was an all-star level dancer uh, in the West Coast Wing community, I ran into Chris uh, in the basement of 37 Main out in Buford, <laughs> and that was that was interesting. Uh, I saw him and Ariella dancing, and uh, his, his girlfriend, longtime girlfriend, and I, I was in the ballroom community. Uh, my studio was just down the street, and I asked her to do a merengue, and that was the kickoff of that relationship. So one day we're shooting pool, and he's like, "Man, you got to come out to, to Grand Nationals." I go out to Grand Nationals, I fall in love with West Coast Swing, I go to ASC to compete for my first time, and he introduces me to you at at that point. So Chris has been huge instrumental in, in my dance journey with this whole thing and how I actually got to meet you. But I wanna know how you got to know Chris. Because I know that Chris has been in the dance community for forever, but what was that relationship like and that, that relationship build? You know, that's a great question, and uh, it's a little fuzzy for me. I think, I think the first place that we actually met was at Wicked Westy, though. I think he had come out, and uh, I, I, my, my earliest recollection of him was he was just so, he was, I don't know how old he was, but he was young. He was, for the community, the regular dancers at Wicked Westy, he was like, 17 or 18 I'll say 18 I think I don't know he was he was young I'm, I may not mm -hmm. be the right age but generally speaking he was young but he was uh, just outgoing gregarious just like having just like having a blast and um, he just uh, just invoked a lot of um, positivity and and just just this absolute just having a ball and uh, you know, I think that's uh, from that personality side of, of, of him, I think that's really kind of, um, you know, just one of the things that, you know, you see in people and, and you know, it uh, just kind of catches you. And, and I think the, uh, from that perspective, him being new to the community, and that's one of the things that I really try to do is make sure that I'm meeting people as they're walking into Wicked Westy that are new. And I want to, you know, shake their hand, introduce myself to them, thank them for coming out. And um, as the host, I, I feel, you know, um, it's, it's an honor when somebody new walks through that door. And uh, just uh, Chris's energy, though, was just, just spectacular. And, uh, and I, I think that's one of the things that um, just my earliest memories. And then from that 
time forward, I know he got involved with traveling a little bit and one of the local shoe vendors. Mm -hmm. And so from, from, that, uh, from that perspective, I knew he lived a little bit further away from the Atlanta area, so it wasn't like he could always make it to Wicked Westie. But at, at that time, you know, um, traveling to an event, you know, once a month, you know, I would always see him, you know, vending shoes and be in there. So it was always mm -hmm. just, you know, nice to say hello and um, just just see uh, see him and uh, and uh, that smiling face. And so, uh, uh, so I think uh, from that perspective, it's just uh, I had an appreciation for who he was and um, and just the passion that he brought to uh, to the dance and how he put himself into it. You've already used one word. <clears throat> to describe him, which is gregarious. And I think that that's a phenomenal word. <laughs> However, I'm going to strike that from, from this next thing. You are allowed to describe Chris in one word. Gregarious is off the table. What would you use to describe him? Can I make up a word? <laughs> you can try. Uh, it's English, man. We've been making up words since the beginning. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll I'll stick to the word uh, energetic. Okay, uh, energetic, and uh, I think that's a good word. I'll 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 take your energetic and I'll raise you one, and that is loyal. Loyal. That man no matter how long it goes between him and I talking, and we spent, we've never hung out a ton. We've hung out a, a, a little bit at events. We've hung out a little bit, right? We caught each other just in passing. I had just moved down here from, from Charlotte, and he was just getting ready to move up to Charlotte uh, for a business opportunity, and we just barely caught each other in passing and became <laughs> really close friends. Um, and he was one of the first people, uh, when things started going south for me in the ballroom dancing business, he was one of the first guys that looked at it and said, what are you doing? Get out, get out now. And I thought he was crazy. I thought, because I, I, I trusted my, my business mentor at the time, uh, who was also one of my partners. And uh, he was like, dude, you're nuts. Like, there's no way, there's absolutely no way. And yet, no matter how many times I didn't listen to him or how many times, like, or how long it goes in between talking to this guy, I can always, I know for a fact, I can pick up the phone and be like, yo, Chris, gave a pool? <laughs> and he's just like, yeah, man, let's go. So, uh, and the way that he introduced us, um, actually, because the way he introduced us was I needed a place to crash. I was traveling back and forth to ASC from my apartment out in Gwinnett. And ASC is held in the Atlanta Swing Classic, the, the big event that, that you help run, which we're going to get into next, um, is held like downtown or in, in the inner loop of, right. of Atlanta. Yep. And, uh, and I was like, man, is there, do you know anybody that I could crash this? Like, hold on, I'm going to get a hold of Alan. I was, I was, it ended up not working out that, that night, but I was like, he got me in contact with you so I could crash on the couch in your hotel room. That's how this whole relationship started. It's all, all because of Chris. So the, the next person I want to ask you about is one of the champions that, that makes his bread and butter in the dance community, good old Tennessee boy, PJ Turner. How did you meet PJ? Uh, I met PJ, uh, obviously through dance, uh, from... Uh, the way I met him actually more was a uh, teacher-student relationship mm -hmm. initially. Uh, uh, PJ and his wife Lisa and uh, Jim and Kelly Rainey uh, were both living up in the Knoxville area, so it's about four hours from here. And they were teaching uh, at a country bar called uh, Cotton Eye Joe up there. I believe it's called Cotton Eye Joe. And um, <laughs> that has to be a lawsuit <laughs> waiting to happen. <laughs> called the, maybe called the Joe. Um, <laughs> but they were teaching up there, and they. Uh, they always were putting on, um, I think the first time I ever saw, saw the four of them was actually at USA Grand Nationals. And they, they did a little uh, team uh, competition. And I just remember them having so much fun. And I was just really impressed and, uh, with, uh, with the dance and the movement and, and just uh, their slightly different style from, from the way that I had learned. And, uh, and I wanted to know more. And they had been teaching up in Knoxville, and they were charging like ten or fifteen dollars for like two hours of workshops. And in 
In the West Coast, well, in any dance form, that's a pretty darn good price. That's a steal. It's a steal. Okay, that's a steal. And so, but they were doing it because they enjoyed doing it. Uh -huh. uh, if you ask PJ, he'll say, yeah, we were just doing it so we'd have beer money. Uh, <laughs> PJ would say that. Yes, so yes, not, he would. Not, I'm, I'm okay yes, saying that. The one, so I got to be in one workshop, and I, I have to tell this story. Going to this one workshop, it was a rhythm workshop. We did a little bit of dancing, but the dancing that we did was not nothing that you would think that it's West Coast Swing. We were like walking to, diff to different rhythms that weren't the rhythm that you typically learn whenever you're dancing West Coast Swing. And it was all about this point of uh, making this point of the different ways to accentuate your dance and to stay on time, be on time, and how to play with timing in your dancing. And PJ's workshop was like going to dance church. He was up in the DJ booth like it was a pulpit preaching dance to us. It was hilarious. You, were, you would have thought that you were at a Southern revival if you didn't hear the words <laughs> Rhythm ones and twos and all this weird, it, like all the clapping that we did with it. It was like, I'm gonna clap, I wish I would clap with me. Like, it's like, can I get an amen? So yeah, the beer money thing is absolutely PJ, 100%. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I think from the dance, uh, the dance, I, you know, learning, uh, but just boiling down to it, he's, he's outgoing, mm -hmm. he's friendly, he, I, I don't know that, you know, anybody that's ever walked to him has, has walked away with, you know, not saying this is an, this is an amazing person. And uh, so I, I think just, again, kind of that, that openness, that welcome feeling that, um, that I've seen so many times within the West Coast Swing community. I, I, I saw that in PJ and uh, being local, uh, you know, local four hours, um, kind of regional, uh, regional people and as I was starting to develop Wicked Westy, I was also looking for ways, um, as I said earlier, you know, I know my limitations and I can only take people so far, but here's another, you know, good dancer and we became friends. And then, you know, from that perspective, um, you know, just looking for ways to not only improve myself, but improve my community. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, I think those are things that really, you know, kind of initially started that friendship. And, and so I saw ways that he could help but beyond that, it's just, again, getting back to the idea that uh, PJ is just, uh, you know, friendly. He's um, open. Um, and what you see is what you get. What you see is what you get. Absolutely. And, uh, and I really appreciate that, um, that genuineness um, that he brings. Yeah. So at what point did the friendship decide to develop into, uh, hey, let's run an event? So, so right. for, for the audience, Alan runs, uh, is one of the main organizers of uh, the Atlanta Swing uh, Classic. Yeah. And so it's what we call ASC. It's hosted in, um, what's that area of... of uh, kind of like the, the Dunwoody area. Yeah, Dunwoody area of Atlanta. It's right off the inner loop um, out there. Huge event, like exploded almost overnight. Like two years, three years, you guys were having like 600 people. Yeah, we uh, when the the event is owned by the Atlanta Swing Dancers Club, mm -hmm. um, and so I think the first year that um, that I ran it with PJ was twenty thirteen or twenty fourteen. It might have been, I think it's twenty. My first year was y'all's third year. Okay, and that was in twenty sixteen. Okay, so I think twenty thirteen. So twenty thirteen sounds sense. about right. Right, and so we had started it and. Uh, we had started running the event. Um, again, we, um, you know, we, the, the club invited us. They, um, we have a contract, you know, kind of says, mm -hmm. you know, certain expectations. And, and from that perspective, though, I, again, going back to knowing oneself, I know, I know from myself, I'm, I'm more of the planner, organizer type person. And I felt like I needed uh, another person that would be able to contribute more of the for lack of a better description, personality side, mm -hmm. right? And so, uh, and I, I think from from that side of it, um, my already having a friend there, um, and just you know knowing where some of my strengths were and um, some of PJ's strengths, I think from that perspective, I was like, hey, you know, there's this opportunity. I think it would be a really unique thing to to be able to uh, take a leadership role. And so, um, are you interested in 
and, and working with me and, and, you know, taking this event and, and livening it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And as you said, over the first couple of years, the event was um, when we first took it over, um, I think the year before they had about 220 people or so. And um, the very next year after PJ and I, um, the first year that PJ and I took, took it over, I think we had like 400 people there. We had almost doubled the attendance in one year. Yeah, yeah there was over 600 people there the year that yeah. I was there and leaving out of that event, you guys were looking to sell out. Like, like at the event, you guys sort of announced that like it, the registration is more or less open for next year. Right. And you guys were, were thinking that the, the hotel was going to sell out yep. for that following year. Right. Like that weekend. Right. That was blew my mind. I was like, they're going to need a bigger hotel. <laughs> well, and that's actually what ended up happening. It was, uh, it was actually really challenging behind the scenes stuff. Um, we actually had the contract with the, the hotel that was um, the Westin um, mm -hmm. over there um, in North Atlanta, the Dunwoody area too. But we just, we knew that we needed more space and um, we were concerned about comfort for everybody. And so, yeah, uh, we got to that point pretty quickly where we had to move into the bigger venue. Mm -hmm. And again, just putting putting good energy into it, uh, creating the right vibe. And um, a lot of it though is, uh, uh, you know, just the people. And, you know, as much as, um, you know, PJ and I are quite often the, the, the faces it's really the Atlanta Swing Dancers Club and so many volunteers that are behind the scenes that are just right there with us mm -hmm. um, that really make this event come together. So it seems like there's a lot of time that is spent on all of this stuff and you have a full-time <laughs> job. Yeah. It's like no-brainer, impetus, minds of the driven. It's obvious that you're a driven individual. Where does your drive come from? Like what was the impetus in your life that was like, no, I... I'm gonna do these things and I'm not gonna let anybody tell me no. Yeah, I, I think um, there's a unique, um, unique aspect about what I would consider like the weekly dances, such as the Atlanta Swing Dancers Club or Wicked Westy versus the Atlanta Swing Classic. I think for the weekly dances, a lot of it is just seeing the pure joy and um, giving people the opportunity to do something in a comfortable way that they may not have done before. And again, kind of going back to like the idea of Olivia and some of the other teachers um, that currently help, um, or, or DJs are just like giving those people the opportunity to um, to contribute in ways maybe they had never expected. And actually, um, a while back, uh, one of the teachers um, that at Wicked Westy had told me that through teaching at the dance, they had become more comfortable in their professional world mm -hmm. because they were more comfortable speaking to people, mm -hmm. especially people they didn't know. And so when they took some of the skills that they were, I guess, offered, you know, in Wicked Westy, that they took them, those skills that they gained in a friendly atmosphere, no pressure atmosphere, like, these are just people that want to learn how to dance. You're the smartest person in the room talking to them. You're okay. <laughs> but taking those skills of being comfortable in the, that atmosphere and taking them into the professional world, like, those are things that are really neat. Mm -hmm. And uh, just having the opportunity to um, see that um, see friendships happen, know that people are going out to pizza afterwards, and just all these uh, relationships that are, uh, that are built. And so those are things that I take pride in um, on, on a week-to-week -week and day-to-day -day basis. Uh, from, for the national event, though, the Atlanta Swing Classic, a lot of that, uh, I think a lot of that drive really comes from just the idea of, of just how cool it is. I, I equate it almost to like cooking, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you're cooking this fancy meal, you got 20 different ingredients, you spend all day doing it, uh, you get everything prepped, you cook it and all this other stuff and you eat it and it takes like 15 minutes to eat, right? Same thing with like, uh, you know, a dance event, right? You, you're, you're planning 362 days of the year and then you have three days of, of all this energy coming mm -hmm. together and then hopefully perfect harmony. And just seeing seeing people having a good time and you know just enjoying the moment enjoying the people enjoying the dance and i'm um, just having uh in the west coast swing world the the swung over feeling on yeah. monday where you're just so tired because you've just you stayed up longer than you should you've just had put all this put all of yourself onto the dance floor Damn. and uh being an extrovert i get this like serious endorphin high and, um, because of just 
how excited I am being an extrovert, being around so many people, and it's something that I love, and it's dancing, which is more endorphins and <laughs> all the time, and it's and I'm sleep deprived. Like the crash after that is worse than a hangover because it's not something that hits me physically. It's something that hits me emotionally. Like coming down off of that, looking back on that experience and seeing how awesome it was, coming down off of that is like the best worst thing in the world because I had a phenomenal time. Why did it have to end? <laughs> um, and ASC, it, I, that's one of the ones that I, every time that I, I've been to a few of them where I've come back and I've been like, yeah, it was fun. ASC is one of the ones where I'm just like, it's one of the places that I call, like, I, I claim two hometowns. I claim Charlotte and I claim Atlanta. Charlotte's where I grew up and Atlanta was the first place that I moved when I stepped out on my own. And this is my, this is my West Coast Swing home. This is where I started dancing West Coast Swing. And so I take a lot of personal pride. It's like that, that's my home event, right? That, that's my home field. Like, you know, the, the home field advantage for me is going to ASC, being in Atlanta. Um, and so the, the, the come down off of that high. Yeah. Um, is there anybody that you have really looked up to as a, as a mentor uh, that has helped influence that, that same type of drive that has helped uh, instill the same the work ethic and the, and the I'm not going to quit. I'm going to see this through all of that type of stuff. Because the next thing I'm going to ask you is going to be like, what are some of the struggles that you faced, and, and how did you make it through it? Whenever you're developing the the uh, event, what are some of them that are like one time horror stories, and then like uh, what is some of the stuff that um, is sort of consistent? It's a battle that you sort of got to face every year, and you kind of get better at facing. Um, but who first, like, who is that, who is that person for you? There's, there's a lot of people that have had, uh, that have been extremely influential in my, you know, dance career as, as well as my life. And, um, I, I think within my career, I'll kind of touch on a couple different people really quickly. I think mm -hmm. for my professional career, Ashwin Patel, he was my first, my first real supervisor mm -hmm. um, at the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. And uh, he just, uh, he wanted to see me succeed. He wanted to see his team succeed. And he, he made it so that we could. And I, I think just seeing, seeing that and the tutelage that he provided, um, I can remember one time very, very distinctly, um, we, were in a, we were in a meeting and uh, I flew off the handle. I was, I was way out of line, I knew it. And um, he could have um, you know, just you know, shot me down right there, just you know, blown me out of the water in front of a number, number of people, but he didn't. He, he took, took what I did, you know, steered away from that, that energy that I'd put on the table in that meeting and then counseled me later. And the way he handled that, um, I'm forever grateful. Um, in, the, in the dance community, um, the, the Dillos, uh, Tony and Debbie and their family, um, they were actually uh, some of the people that I learned um, dance from first. The other piece though is that they were also traveled. So when we talked earlier about you know Orange Blossom or mm -hmm. Floor Play, they were some of the people that I originally traveled with. And one of the things that I think is really cool about dance events is when we when we go to dance events, a lot of times we'll we'll spend time and you know we'll to save money we'll room with our friends, right? Yep. Um, or sometimes crash on a stranger's couch. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> and a couple of years later, enough of the podcast, I'll, you never know. You never know what's gonna happen. <laughs> But from that perspective, they were local teachers, but they, um, they're, they're, they're old enough that I've, they have kids that are my age, right? Mm -hmm. But they made me feel welcome, and they, they allowed me to stay with them when we traveled um, to dance events, and they just, they really kind of welcomed me into the community. And again, going back to like that welcoming feeling that I try and personify today, I think they really personified that initially for me. And uh, so, um, those those uh, those folks are some of the probably the most influential people in terms of um, where I am today professionally and uh, and with uh, with my career. Mm -hmm. So, what it 
if you were willing to tell a story out of school, um, what is a, a story from uh, the management building of ASC or, or, or even in the community that was just like a horror freak show and how did you get out of it? Uh, yeah. It took me a moment, but I got okay. it. <laughs> you know, um, there was, um, before the Atlanta Swing Classic, and after Wicked Westy, there was a dance event called Sweet Side of Swing. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I was the owner, or I am the owner, and uh, I, I ran the event. Um, and the very first year that we put it on, um, I, had, I had only hired four teachers. And there wasn't a lot of room <laughs> for, for anything to, to happen where somebody didn't show up. But one of, one of, the, one of the teachers, um, I, I can't remember if it was the night before. I actually think it was the day of the, the workshop actually supposing to, supposed to start. Mm -hmm. um, I got the phone call that I'm stuck. I am not going to be able to make it. I'm really sorry. And um, as an event director, you're like, I got 200 people that are showing up later today. I need this person to help because I just, the, with all the classes that are going on everywhere, I, I just needed that fourth instructor. And, uh, and so really quickly, we, um, uh, we called uh, Deborah Seke. Uh, she's a, a, a great uh, pro, uh, uh, well-known teacher, mm -hmm. um, a many-time champion, and, and just uh, you know, a, a resume from here to there yeah. in terms of the West Coast Swing world. One of my favorite videos, if it's the same Deborah that I'm thinking of, it's a video of her and Michael Kim at Trilogy. It might be. It yeah. might be, yeah. And uh, so uh, we uh, we reached out to her the morning of the event. She's like, "I'm on it. I will. I'm driving to the airport. I'll be there tonight." And she wow. was. And uh, I, I think <clears throat> I think that that again kind of gets back to the just like the passion that people put into the into our community. Mm -hmm. This is this is a professional. This is a person that we got kind of lucked out. Just. Um, some of these professionals travel 50 weekends a year, mm -hmm. and we just happened to luck out um, that she hadn't been hired somewhere. And uh, but I'm just most grateful for for her just saying yes, mm -hmm. saying yes, and saying I can help, and 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 she did. So there are a lot of communities that could really use some help getting built up. I know the Hampton Roads area where I'm at. Um, the the leader of our community, uh, Deb. Uh, took a job in, in Richmond and so uh, it, you know right after COVID started to sort of slow down and everything like that and so there's a big uh, there's a big gap in at least what I knew as the as the community um, in that area what would you give as advice to someone that wants to build a community in in an area that may have either just a, a really small following or no following at all uh, leap of faith, right? Yeah. Uh, you, you talked a little bit about it earlier, and I, I think um, you had mentioned a couple authors earlier um, that you're a fan of, and one of them being Simon uh, Semenek, and um, uh, one of his books is, you know, Start With Why, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think from that standpoint, you know, why are, why are you doing it? And I mean, if your, your passion and your intent is true, um, you know, follow that passion. And then on top of that, I think one of the biggest challenges, and this is even a challenge for myself, let people help because there are people out there that want to help. And so be willing to receive that, allow people to contribute in the ways they can and want to. Mm -hmm. And from that perspective, you know, put good energy into it, find good people. And, um, you know, uh, you know, Dale Carnegie says, right, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room, just surround yourself with smart people, right? And right. so, you know, you build that team and uh, you find those people. And I, I think if you put, like I said, put good energy out there, you're going to, receive that energy in return. So I'm assuming having been in uh, in this realm of, of the dance community and stuff, the volunteers and things like that, one of the roadblocks that I can sort of see happening with the idea of let people help is when someone does that and then they get burned because yes. it's, it's going to happen. You right. don't go into business anywhere <laughs> ever at all whatsoever doing anything. I don't care if it's a nonprofit or your own LLC you're gonna get burned. The hardest part about being successful in life is learning to manage personalities. Right. And uh, it, it, in my 
business venture, my first business venture that got me to move down here to Atlanta originally, that was one of the biggest takeaways that I learned from that, from that whole thing. Uh, so first of all, what, like, ha- have you been burned? What was that situation uh, like? And then how did you move forward from it? And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, how do you learn to read people a little bit more so that you can make a better judge of that. So start start with me for, uh, uh, g- give me a tale, oh, obviously no names, I, my, our, our job here isn't to embarrass anybody, but, but give us a, a story of uh, a time that you uh, trusted someone, um, and not just like, hey, I can't, I can't be there, but like, you got really burned uh, by someone in, in a situation that you were, you know, relying on and, and your thought process to come around on that. <clears throat> Yeah, that's a that's a challenging question, and uh, when I where my where my mind immediately goes, it it really comes down to to going back to what I said a few moments ago. Is, you know, surrounding yourself with the right people, and mm-hmm. and as you said, there there can be times where you uh, you have people around you, and. Um, and maybe their intent is one thing and, and you see that intent and maybe there's other things beyond it. And, uh, and as much as you'd like to uh, believe, um, you know, people act with good intention, there's, there's things that you see or hear that maybe, you know, cause you to believe that uh, uh, maybe the intention isn't, isn't exactly what you thought. Mm-hmm. And I, I think one of the most challenging things is, you know, finding the right medium to have conversations with um, those people. And, uh, you know, challenging conversations are, can be challenging, right? And uh, um, especially when there's conflict mm-hmm. and um, finding your way through them um, is ultimately you have to remember, um, you know, there's times where you gotta think about yourself and, and is the energy that I'm putting there and the trust that I'm putting in certain people, um, the right people that I should be. And um, if there's warning signs, you, you know, you, you should pay attention to them and and do your best to understand and uh, seek to understand. And if if what you're hearing and what you're seeing just doesn't necessarily add up to what you had hoped or what you had believed or what you had put the trust into a particular individual. You, you have to take those steps um, to, to part ways. And What are some immediate warning signs? I wouldn't say red flags, but yellow. I think red flags are pretty easy for anybody to spot. But what are some yellow flags that you look for uh, in people whenever you're looking at someone that, you know, either might want to volunteer or might be wanting to get involved in something or, or someone new that you don't know quite well enough yet to make sure that they're good people to keep in your circle, what are some yellow flags that you might look at and be like, eh, I don't know? I, I think some of the yellow flags that I kind of, um, that I've learned to mm-hmm. start seeing over time are where uh, people might s- start asking to like, you know, bend the, you know, toe the line a little bit or, you know, kind of stretch the rules a little bit or, um, you know, in ways that just don't seem necessarily in line with the, the greater, the bigger picture. And, and I'm, I personally try and, and believe that I, I trust first, right? Mm-hmm. And it, you can definitely <laughs> cause me to take that trust away, but I'm, I'm gonna trust you. I, I do believe that people, people's intent is, is good and positive. And, uh, but when you start to see these as you said, yellow flags where, or warning signs where, you know, maybe something just kind of seems out of line of what I'm putting into, into the group or into the event or into that. That's where I start to maybe kind of, you know, spend, uh, you know, tune my ear into that kind of, uh, into that particular situation a little bit more, just to, just to make sure that I'm understanding and, um, the intent and Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so long as I can understand intent that'll help me I think eventually lead me to make good sound decisions so here in just a second I'm going to uh, ask you to talk a little bit about how 
uh, the pandemic has impacted the dance community and the culture and the community and things of that nature. But first, I have to give a shout out to myself because, shameless plug, I have written a book. It is called You're Not Special, You're Gifted. Uh, many of you, like me, grew up in a world that was plagued with uh, participation trophies. And it taught us a very unrealistic expectation for life that everyone gets a trophy, everyone gets to be successful uh, just for showing up. And the sad reality is, is that that's not what helps you. What helps you is learning to identify the things that you have been gifted with, the thing that you are especially equipped, the problem that you are especially equipped to solve in this world, and then having the courage to go out and get good at your gifts and then use them to give back into the world and to give unto others that others may give. The antidote for all of that, the confusion, the questions, how do I do that is all in this book. It's thin for a reason. It's meant for you to read it and then apply it. You should be spending more time applying whatever it is that I have written in this than you should reading this thing. And if you need a reminder, you can go back and read it and reread it and then read it again. So if you want a short way to get good at your gifts, a roadmap, I have formulas in here that will help you on your journey figuring out what it is that you're gifted with, where it is that you want to take your life, how it is that you want to make an impact, and how to crush the coward that speaks discontent in the back of your head and tells you that you can't go out and do the things that you want to do. I cover all of that in this book. Make sure that you grab a copy. It goes live August 24th. So by the time we're putting this out, it'll probably be out by then. So make sure you order a copy. It is available in several major retailers. Barnes & Noble carries it. Obviously, it is available on Amazon. And you can always go over to 400productions.locals.com and check out what type of deals we are having on it over there. You never know when we're going to run a special and be giving away some of them for free. But all of that is going to be for supporters only. So again, that is 400productions.locals.com. And the book is called You're Not Special, You're Gifted. COVID has destroyed all of us <laughs> in a certain way. All of our lives got put on, on an indefinite hold for a year, right? 15 days, or, or yeah, 15 days to slow the spread ended up being like 400 some. Um, and it's taken a lot of people uh, away from us. It has uh, changed people um, indefinitely with side effects that will linger for the rest of their lives. Uh, so it's not something that I want to make light of. However, there is a point where we have to begin to pick up and move on from it um, if we want to get back to doing things like dancing. Uh, however, I have also uh, noticed that not only nationally, but specifically in, in our community, um, there have been some culture shifts. And so I, I want to know from you, what is the biggest uh, impact that COVID has had on the dance community besides shutting it down for a year and a half? Well, when you, when you say uh, impact, uh, there's a number of things that um, immediately come to mind. Uh, just speaking for myself first, uh, I, I miss the people. I miss uh, those uh, social interactions. Uh, I, I miss seeing, seeing those, those friends on Thursday night and just having, knowing that I'm going to be able to go there and say hello and uh, shake their hand, give them a hug, um, share a dance, uh, ask about their week, you know, find out what's going on. Uh, and so um, when we talk about impacts, uh, I'm, uh, for me personally, I kind of float between the introvert extrovert uh, line. I'm probably right in the middle. If I took a Myers Briggs test, I'd probably score an E one day, and the mm -hmm. next day I might score an I. So, um, you know, I'm kind of floating that middle uh, piece. And I'll tell you, the the past 18 months, my my eye is full. My introvert side is full. I'm <laughs> so ready to 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 extrovert, and so just be around people again. And um, Without uh, without concern, and then uh, I think some of the other things that I've I've definitely seen is uh, people um, like like you know, we were talking about earlier, PJ Turner, PJ, uh, you know, that's his career is dance and going to events and and teaching uh, private lessons and group <coughs> lessons and and st stuff like that. So um, so one of the other things is PJ Turner and just dances his career mm -hmm. and. 
uh, for him, I've just I've, I've seen you know the careers for um, certain individuals be you know paused or taken away from them um, due to COVID, due to due to safety concerns, and uh, and then the other thing too is uh, just listening to people and everybody. Um, Everybody has a perspective. Everybody has personal thoughts and opinions, mm -hmm. and uh, and they're all valid. So one of the big divides that is being pushed in all of our lives right now, and it's almost impossible for it not to permeate uh, into the dance culture, is um, the the vaccinated versus non-vaccinated. Those that that want to trust the vaccine and. and and they think it's a safe thing to do. And then those that that don't trust the vaccine because of how fast it was rushed out or for whatever it is, the sure. sources that they're getting information from. Um, so far, any event that has been open, um, save for one in Florida, um, has been vaccinated only individuals. And online, in some of the dance chats and things like that, there seems to be an increasing divide uh, or, or even like this brewing animosity. I, I wouldn't say it's quite to animosity yet, but it, it could almost seem to get there between those that are vaccinated and those that are not vaccinated. Um, so as, as an event uh, coordinator, as a leader in the community in a certain way, um, how do you see that divide impacting the community as a whole and what can we do to curb to, to curb around that like how can we avoid that split because i i don't ever want there to be a, a dance community where the vaccinated go over here and the unvaccinated go over here and it's like two different circuits of events happening um is there is that on the radar of event organizers, or at least from from uh, the ASC perspective? I know that you, it, I don't want you to speak out of turn for someone else. Um, right. But how do you how do you see event organizers addressing that? You know, I see uh, I see event directors uh, taking uh, a multitude of approaches, and and I, I think. For each event director, it ultimately will come back to their their own messaging, mm -hmm. and and being able to articulate why. Uh, for me personally, I I take great responsibility when when I open that door for Wicked Westy, uh, in terms of being the event host, and I I feel a sense of responsibility for every person that walks through that door. And from that perspective, for myself, that's where I'm challenged with the questions of, you know, what is safe? And how are my decisions potentially impacting every person that walks through that door? And with COVID, potentially every person that that person then comes in contact with. Mm -hmm. and. And so from that perspective, I, I think that's one of the things that weighs most heavily on my mind is how my decisions potentially impact others. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, everybody, I believe, um, sees their own responsibility um, as the event director or, or the leader or the person that opens the doors, so yeah. to speak in a different light and mm -hmm. their sense of, of what their responsibility is to their community is, is not gonna be the same responsibility that I personally feel. Mm -hmm. As a whole, what do you think is the best thing that we can do to remain unified as a dance community in the midst of us versus them messaging that we're getting in the media, all over, social, all over social media, from every source around. Yeah, that's a great question, and and one that I've one that I've contemplated uh, quite a bit. And 
And the thing that I acknowledge is speaking from a sense of now just an individual, not not an event director, not a, not a person organizing that local dance. My risk tolerance is going to be different than yours. Mm. It's going to be different than the next person's. And we're, we're all going to have different risk tolerances. And, and I respect that. And I, I appreciate that because we're all different. And, right. and so having those differing views and differing thoughts as to what's okay for you or for me, you know, me personally versus you personally, I'm, I'm okay with that. And, and what I would hope is that we as individuals seek to understand why somebody is making a choice mm -hmm. and be understanding of that and be, while you may not necessarily agree, at least take a moment to try and seek to understand why a person might be making such a choice. And again, you may not necessarily agree. What I would ask though is that everybody within that community understand and not necessarily put a negative tone mm -hmm. or negative energy onto somebody that might be making a decision that you don't necessarily agree with. And, and that's really challenging, especially when a personal belief might be something that you see somebody just without seeking the why, mm -hmm. just seeing the what especially if that what kind of infringes on somebody's personal belief, right. that's really challenging to take that breath, take that moment to get beyond the what to try and seek out the why. I, I really like how it, it always is sort of coming back, at least in this episode, we're coming back to like, ask the why, figure out the why, find the stability, find the even keel and, and discover the why yeah. behind why are you leading? Why is it that you want to start a community? Why is it that you are wanting to dance? Why is it that uh, that you are feeling a certain way towards an individual? Why is that individual making the choice that they're making? Um, and then also really, I, I love the idea of just making the conscious agreement, uh, the, the conscious pact amongst all of us to like respect every person's individual risk assessment. You know. Uh, if there's one thing that I just constitute as being an indicative part of, of being American is the, the ability to have individual risk assessment and to exercise that individual risk assessment. Um, and to whether, whether it's agreed with or disagreed with, to be able to look at you and say, you know what, I, I might disagree with you, but it doesn't make you a bad person, right? Um, and I think that's huge. I think that's something that's that's uh, waning. I don't think it's gone quite yet. Well, that's really powerful. That's extremely powerful. Yeah. And uh, one that one that I hope um, you know everybody in our community can can kind of uh, take a moment to to pause and and think about and and see how um, see how that resonates with them and and. Um, be introspective about what the energy they are putting into that community and it's it's challenging it's really challenging to be introspective and 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 pause to to try and understand the why mm -hmm. so last question and then we're gonna get into a lightning round and wrap this up and do a little bit of dancing and I know you gotta go oh, you gotta work tomorrow man um, so the uh, you're not as lucky as me. I just get to like interview people. <laughs> this is great. Um, the the playing field has been leveled. COVID, ha in a lot of ways, has really re-leveled the playing field. Um, no one's been traveling to events. No one's been uh, like people might have been drilling at home and taking online lessons and stuff here and there, but. If anyone wants to get into or rediscover the habit of dancing, seems like now is a great time. Absolutely. What type of words of encouragement would you give to a first time entrant into, into the dance community or uh, to someone that might have put it down and is thinking about getting back into it now? Well, I, I think um, 
to everybody that's contemplating exploring dance for the first time or or coming back into it is 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 feeling uh understanding the idea of of coming into that community of of looking to have have fun learn something new meet some people dance uh, move when it comes down to it I, I really think that you know dancing and, and West Coast swing really kind of hits a lot of those really great movement and social aspects there's ways to stimulate your brain in learning there's interactions of meeting people and memory um, movement so to a certain degree movement is a form of exercise mm -hmm. and and then all of that I think just kind of um, you know, I, I'm talking, I give goosebumps talking about this stuff. It's just like, it's just like, uh, just like all these, uh, I guess the endorphins, just the, mm -hmm. the good feeling that you have about just doing all those things. But again, um, I think that the ask to the leaders and the teachers is really strive to make people feel, feel like they're welcome. And for the people that are new or just getting back to it, you know, give it a shot. Don't be concerned about knowing it perfectly the first day. See, see just the fun. Take a moment to stick around after class and see people dance and just having enjoyment of being there, being with people, moving and, and, and just sharing joy. And so I, I would hope that, um, you know, people just get out and, and find this as a, a way to have a, a really great time in a, a great community of, of people that are really just ready to, to get out and, and socialize and have fun. It's an awesome note to end on, man. So we're gonna get into the lightning round. <laughs> the lightning round is just a list of questions where you're going to give me like the first thing off the top of your head. Okay, so it doesn't have to be one word answer, but it does have to be quick. I'm a little nervous. You're not, you're not allowed to, to think about the whole lot with the very first day. I, was I wasn't coming. prepped for this, man. You didn't prep me. <laughs> That's the great. Yeah, I used to prep people for this, and the, and the whole way I prepped them for it was I was like, I'm just going to ask you some, uh, some like one word topics. And then I realized like, <laughs> it's so much more fun just to just surprise people with this thing. So I'm ready. All right. Atlanta. Uh, Peaches. <laughs> the beach. Um, sand. Windy city. Uh, home. Robert Royston. Uh, Roro. <laughs> Just Roro. That's Roro, all. that's his brand. That's all we get. That's his brand. Yep, that, that is his brand, isn't it? That, 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 talk about an interesting character. Strokin', man. The, the song Strokin'. <laughs> Stro so, sorry, I got something in my eye, man. <laughs> You're okay. Give me a second. Sorry, folks. I literally have something in my god my eye. It makes me look like I'm crying. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned Roro and he's just in tears. It's so great. It's so <laughs> great. Oh my god. I just remember that dance with Trendelin. It's amazing. <laughs> One step. Say that again? One step. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> fun stories. Okay. Did you want to share one? Uh, uh, yeah, so a group of us went out to, um, went out to this, uh, this 80s, 90s party at a hotel. We were very out of place, <laughs> <Okay>. very <laughs> out of place. And uh, um, it was all West Coast Swing dancers. Um, and it was just people like kind of in a disco atmosphere, just bumping and grinding on each other. And so we were just kind of sitting on the side and a woman came up to me and, and asked me um, if I wanted to dance. And I was like, uh, yeah, sure. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of new to this. I really don't know, um, even though I knew how to do some dancing. But for that, a little uncomfortable for me. And uh, she's just, it's just like, it's just, and she's, it's the two step. You just do it like this. So she took a moment to show me. And then, uh, you know, I, I did what she showed me. She taught me real quick. Uh, we, we danced the dance. Uh, it, was a, it was a great time. She was uh, very sweet. Uh, I, I felt extremely awkward, but it was <laughs> it was just amazingly uh, amazingly cute and uh, and such a, a fun memory with uh, uh, all the people that were there at that event. Man. <laughs> all right, last one. When are you gonna let me MC at ASC? We'll see about that. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> you heard it here. <laughs> he didn't say no. <laughs> Man, it's been a real pleasure having you here. Thank you so much for stopping by, making time, and for letting me keep you so long on a night where you got to go to work, man. Like, I, I really appreciate it. The conversation has been awesome. I love your stories. Your journey has been incredible. And it's hearing your journey and knowing how much you've impacted my journey has been really awesome. I hope that everyone, dancers and non-dancers alike, will get a ton out of this. If you want to see Alan and I go through a really quick beginner's West Coast swing lesson uh, and me make a fool of myself because I haven't danced in absolute months, <laughs> not even practicing, make sure that you go over to forerunnerproductions.locals.com and become a supporter for the bonus content. <laughs> also, grab a copy of my book, You're Not Special, You're Gifted, out August 24th to make sure that you are vectoring your life and you are crushing the coward and that you are using your gifts to give unto others that others may give. This has been Impetus, Minds of the Driven, with Alan and Selva. Thanks for being here again, man. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.